So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Friday Hacks. Uh, today, we are very, very excited to invite Kai Hendry to give us a talk on his journey with Linux. Hi, hi everyone. Um, well, I hope this talk will, I don't know, inspire you to use Linux and I'm aiming at you guys. I think you all, I don't know where you are in your studies, but I think you probably want to get a job at some point. And, uh, and I, the TLDR version of this, if you just want to go, no, you can't eat pizza yet, is that uh, Linux has helped me a lot in my career and I guess the point I want to get across is, is that I, I hope it can help you too. Um, <clears throat> so this is the story of, of Linux and I, so uh, you can go for the next one. So I'm actually born and raised in South Africa uh, a whole bunch of years ago, born in 1978, and I was raised in apartheid South Africa. It was a very different time, uh, and I, was a, I came from a middle-class family, so uh, my dad must have spent um, like thousands of US dollars to get me a PC, and he wanted me to, I don't know, become something like Elon Musk or something, right? <laughs> put, 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 uh, put rockets into space, but in the end, I, when I got my PC, I just played games, absolutely nonstop. And this is uh, the, one of the oldest pictures I could find of, some, of, of a typical LAN party that we had in South Africa. You, have you ever had a LAN party? And you, have you, you know what I mean? Like just going around and... No friends? No friends? Okay. <laughs> Well, the problem back then was that we didn't really have the internet. So when we wanted to trade, um, we called it wares. I'm not going to say the other word for it. Uh, we had to like meet up and tr and set up a little uh, network, and and we and we traded files and uh, pictures of people, and and also <laughs> played games, and it was. Really great. I really miss those times because nowadays, when we, we, especially here in Singapore, you have such great internet. You, there's no re real reason to go outside your room, right? There's no reason to have friends. You can just make internet friends. Those are the worst, by the way. Make real friends, for Christ's sake. Okay, ne next. So um, after I was like born and raised in, in South Africa, I went to a university in England. Did you ever want to go to England, but you ended up in Singapore? I wonder. Or did you? Where are you guys from? China? Or so? I don't know. But I, I went to England to, to study, and I went to a place called Bath University. And uh, to be honest, uh, I still was obsessed by computer games. Really, I mean, who's heard of Quake and Quake Two and Quake Three? Yeah, I was, I was in a Quake clan for the longest time. In fact, the Quake clan that I was in uh, won the league, and I was. Pretty, pretty professional kind of gamer. So when I went to university, one of the first things was I did was set up a, a, a society called Bath University Network Computer Society. It's a bit of a mouthful, but I love. I think you like acronyms here too. What is the, what is the computer game society called here? Do you have one? Great. What is it called? Like NUS Gaming or something? <laughs> NUS G. Or, who who cares? But um, but that's, that was my, like, my major interest, right, just to, just to game. And we set up the, uh, with, with my friends, we, we set up the, the, net, the Network Computing Society, and that's where my journey, my journey began with Linux. Because, as you can imagine, we had all these computers in a room, and uh, we, needed, we needed a server, and Whenever we got the Windows machine running the, the Quake server or something like that, someone would walk in and jump on that machine, like, I want to play on the server. And that's not really fair. If you're playing on the server, you get a bit of an advantage. Just no, 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 no. So I devised an evil plan to get an old computer box and set up a Quake server on it. And I just, I was looking for a way to make the operating system like headless because I didn't want to attach a monitor. And I heard that Linux can do it. And I didn't know anything about Linux. I really didn't know a thing. Uh, I installed, I think, SUSE. And it was quite an ordeal, to be honest. It was the, whole, the whole thing was kind of painful compared to installing Windows. 
Um, I think to its credit, though, the, though, like once you've done it, if you were to reinstall uh, Linux, it took like uh, a quarter of the time it would to do Windows. But anyway, I installed Linux on a box. I installed the Quake server. And inside the Bath University Network Computer Society, we had a server. And that's where we played our, our, our tournaments and stuff on. And that's how I got introduced with Linux. And on, when I installed Linux, I was just impressed that you had the control, you had the source code, the networking stack was actually pretty good. And the whole thing like really ran well on an old Pentium, I don't know, 90 back in those days. So that was my first taste of Linux. Now, next slide. And um, I, I just wanted to boast that I founded the society. You know, this Wayback Machine, this is like 1998. And uh, the cool thing about creating society was that um, all these people are kind of, kind of in touch with still. And this, this guy who was, who was the webmaster, he went on to great things. Ian Hickson is like the editor of HTML. And he's a, he's a really cool guy and super famous in the web community. So I thought I'd do some name dropping. I mean, what else? Next. The next thing I did after University of Helsinki is that I had this opportunity to have a placement. Do you guys have a, a placement opportunity, like exchange? Do you, like where would you go? To Malaysia? No. <laughs> would you go to America or something? Well, um, well, when I was in like the third or fourth year, I had the opportunity to either do like a placement with uh, BT, like British Telecom, in some like weird satellite town, town of London. It looked really, really boring. And the pay was not good either. And then I, and I, just, I just heard from my girlfriend at the time, oh, you could take an Erasmus and go to another country, not work, and they pay you the same amount. I was like, yes, I'm going on an exchange. So that's what I did. I went to University of Helsinki. But to be honest, I heard about University of Helsinki because I ran Linux on that server back in Bath, and I saw the Helsinki uh, mentioned in the credits or something. I knew that University of Helsinki was the home of Linux. I knew if I went there, I would find other Linux users maybe meet Linus Torvalds himself. Unfortunately, when I arrived, Linus was long gone. He moved to the States. And, but there was um, other people just like me. I mean, uh, these guys I just picked out as a picture. I think, I, th I think, I mean, maybe they'll argue with me, but I think it's fair to say we all joined the University of Helsinki because we were like excited about Linux. I mean, Linux back then was like a new and cool thing and something to get excited about. And these guys are all like top guys, except for this guy, he's a bit of a loser. But like, uh, is this recorded? Andre is like, like managing director of like Europe, uh, Google in Europe. He's managing director of like some AI stuff with Lyft, never heard of it. And he works for the European Union, who cares about those guys? <laughs> so um, it was a great time being at University of Helsinki because it sort of ramped up my, uh, my network and, and who I, and, and, my, 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 and my Linux skills. Uh, next slide. So the next part of my Linux journey, God, I hate this word journey. It's got to be a better word. So I became a, a Debian like uh, maintainer uh, developer uh, because I was using Debian. And like I, there was packages that I used. Like for example, uh, I used the package. I, I wanted to have a blog, so. Um, there was a package that, that needed to uh, someone like what do you call that orphaned, and I picked up the package, and that 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 package was called WordPress, and it ruined my life for like years, because the amount of bugs and security issues and all sorts of havoc that it caused me. So I was maintainer of WordPress and some other stuff uh, for for Debian for the, for for a number of years, and. Um, yeah, when I went to, I think this is some Debian conference somewhere. I went to several Debian conferences, but they, they were like the most amazing uh, events for me because I met a whole bunch of, of like-minded people who taught me so much, really. Like, I'm really, I really encourage you to go to a conference. I know they don't sound very cool nowadays, but Debian conference was amazing, absolutely amazing. Uh, like, what's a cool conference nowadays? I probably would like to go to like a Rust one or... Who knows? Whatever's cool, go to the conference. You meet so many good people. Um, 
I mean, I think Daniel Bauman's pretty famous. Uh, that's Chris. He, he was Debian uh, leader for a number of years. So Debian uh, really helped me um, make some really good uh, people. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the, the bit of a jump in time here. Look at that loser. Uh, he, I got like a, someone told me I have a Jew fro. I'm not Jewish, but uh, that's quite the fro there. Uh, so, um, so whew, oh my gosh. Once graduating from the University of Helsinki, a lot of things happened. I, 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 I traveled the world. I actually met my wife in Australia, who's Malaysian, oh my God. And, and, then, um, and then I left Australia because I found it really boring, but sorry Australians, it's probably nice now. Um, and then I went to go teach in Korea because my sister was there, and I just I just wanted to get a, a taste of like you know Japanese. Okay, it wasn't Japan, okay, but it was Korea. It wasn't so bad. And I um, I was teaching English, and to be honest, teaching English and teaching kids is very very difficult. And um, and but I learned about um, a Linux meetup. I don't I don't think they have Linux meetups anymore. But there was a Linux meetup in Seoul, and I went there, and I was like. There was like five people there. Uh, it was a pretty loser situation. And I was like, oh, this, this night is not going to go too well. But there was, there was a guy I met there, Thomas Park, uh, like an um, older guy. He, says, he, he just asked me like very basic questions. Uh, do you know Linux? Yes, yeah, I know Linux. I used it for a while. Um, and maybe asked me a, question, a couple of uh, questions about which distribution I used and maybe where I went to school. And then he basically said, I need, I need you. Um, can you work for me next week? I was like, uh, what? You're going to give me a job? And he says, yeah, I, I need someone to do some work for me. And uh, I didn't even know what the job was, but he was a nice guy. And, I, 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 and to be honest, I, I didn't want to teach kids anymore. So I, I jumped at the opportunity. And um, Thomas Park, my, my new boss, he was actually like a serial entrepreneur. He was the kind of guy that would set up companies in, in Korea and then encourage other uh, companies to, to take them over or buy them. So he was a successful entrepreneur. And he got me like working on a whole bunch of projects, all kind of Linux-based. And the one that I ended up in the longest was um, well, not quite Linux-based, but it was a, a document viewer that's running on like Samsung mobiles at the time. Um, I think I'm running KDE and oh, whatever. Um, it, it was an amazing experience. So, um, and I felt like I felt really uh, cool there because, like, I had a lot of Linux experience, and most of Korea didn't even know the slightest bit about uh, Korea, uh, li Linux. And my my skills were very much in need. Like, they they wanted to like. I think the funniest thing was that there was a there was a Linux distribution called Hanux, and I don't know why the original team left, but I was the maintainer of the Korean li national Linux distribution. For, for like a couple of years. I couldn't even speak or read Korean. It was very embarrassing. Like people would email me and I'm just like, okay, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> I don't even know what they're talking about. But um, it was based on Red Hat. It was just basically like a CentOS rebuild type thing. So, so I used Linux then. And like, oh my God, I mean, who would have imagined I would just be working and getting a nice salary, living in Korea. I, I was earning quite well, I, I mean, I also didn't have a bank account, which was really weird. But just to show you how much I was earning at the time, well, their the, the, the notes were quite small. Like I had, I had, I put my cash in a cupboard, and when I when I got my, I didn't have space for my clothes anymore. It was just full of cash. <laughs> <laughs> my girlfriends at the time didn't like. I mean, they were thinking I was a drug dealer or something. Uh, but yeah, it was a fantastic opportunity. And then, then of course, when I when I was like working on Hanux, like a real operating system with real users, with real operational needs. I, I really like saw the pain points of, of deploying Linux on, with, uh, to people. So I really, really, in, it really inspired me to make a Linux distribution myself. So this is the next slide. So some time passed. Actually, the company that acquired us Let's just say I didn't get on with the CTO and I got fired, but whatever, I got some money. And then I went to Argentina and I bummed around. And then I came back to England and I thought to myself, like, hey, I'll just go work for Google. You know, I'm the shit, I'm the shit. I'll go work for Google. And I've also got this really good idea for a, a web-based operating system. So they're gonna love that. 
I bombed at the interview. It was a complete, because it was like, uh, at that time it was like Java, C++, and Python, and I, they were asking me all these like weird algorithm qu questions, and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> In hindsight, maybe I should have studied a bit, but like, whatever, I mean, I I, look at that, that's funny, the algorithm, like, I didn't use any of this stuff. So this shows you I'm a, I must be an idiot. So I bombed the uh, Google interview, and, but when I was at Google, I did share that idea, and the guy said, it was, oh yeah, really good idea, really good idea. Um, but I think he hinted that Google had their own uh, web-based operating system in the, in, or something. But anyway, I went back to home to UK. I was a bit, um, a bit angry, actually. Like, you know, some people, some people are just depressed when things don't go to plan. For me, I'm, I get fucking angry. And I was like, I'm going to show Google. I'm going to make my own operating system that's going to rock. So I ended up making my own operating system. It was pretty bizarre. Um, and uh, it's, all it does is boot Debian and show uh, like a full screen web browser. I think that's probably not it running, but you can imagine just a bare bone Linux distribution, uh, booting X and booting uh, Firefox, I think. And that, that, was, that was my web-based operating system. Uh, is there a slide after this? Yeah, okay, so, so a lot of time went past, but like I got, I got a bit lucky because I didn't actually have a good, I didn't think, I like, how do I monetize this? I didn't actually really have a great idea. But some guy uh, uh, from a bank, it was, I, I'm gonna say the name, I wasn't allowed to before. This bank called Credit Suisse approached me saying like, hey, you've got this product, we need to roll it out onto our Swiss card branches, and, but we need the uh, URL to be say swisscard.ch instead of webconverter.com. And I was like, ah, yeah, well, you can do it yourself. Just download the source code. Change this one line, make, you got an ISO. So no, 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 we want to pay you to do that. And I was like, what? Pay me to make like a one line change? <laughs> you fucking idiot. <laughs> no. Uh, so I agreed uh, on, a, on a, like a really token sum because I was like, no, 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 no. Um, and then I, and I, and then I um, delivered them, them the ISO and then I was kind of getting similar requests, so I set up a PayPal, uh, uh, what do you call it, web form to buy Web Converger, and yeah, uh, people actually started uh, subscribing to Web Converger. It was just at the time, I think, when PayPal was offering a subscription, so everything kind of linked in really well. So I, I was working for, for people most of the time, like doing contracts, because Web Converger over, like, oh, it, Web Converger as a company, went for, for about 15 years, but only two of those years, I would say I was making money. Like, and when I'm saying I was making money, it's probably not that much money. It was like, I was making like 50,000 US dollars a year. It was not that much money, but it was, it was a lot ha having your own company. If any of you guys have your own company earning 50,000 US dollars, I, I would shake your hand, because it's not bloody easy. So this picture is of me in London, and I guess peak web, web converger, I had uh, 80 uh, of, uh, of these bins. I know it's not very glamorous, but it's a bin. You're supposed to put your trash in there. But on either side of the bin, there was a screen, and that was powered by my software running in, in, uh, in London. So I, I, I don't know. I feel, I feel pretty proud of that, <laughs> even though um, the market for, for web kiosks is very difficult right now, especially when everyone has a, a, a mobile phone, right? So why bother? having this stuff in a, in a public space. So yeah, my, my business work and project kind of, I've actually just wound it up uh, just the other week, would you believe it? But again, the story is about Linux. Linux helped me start a company. Linux helped me write my own software. Linux got my idea off the ground. And yeah, thanks to Linux uh, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff, I got this product um, going. So I hit the next part of the story. I guess the next part of the story is that but this is a bit lame, oh my God. But uh, I, got, I started a YouTube channel, I guess, when I came to Singapore. And that's keeping me going. I'm basically, sh I mean, keeping me going as in like 10 bucks a month. <laughs> is that good? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's embarrassing. But I, I thought I should include a slide because th this is how I, I kind of make, well, this is, this is the most, important thing to me in some ways, because this is where I share my knowledge and I meet other people. That's basically 
that's basically it. Um, next slide. But nowadays, I don't have my own company. Um, I work for uh, ThoughtWorks. I don't know if you heard of them. They're like a big uh, premier consulting company. Much better than Anderson and, I don't know, Cognizant and all the other sucky consultants. <laughs> Sorry, I wipe that out. But um, yeah, I mean, this is my day job. I'm basically an infrastructure engineer. And again, Linux ties into this because, uh, because if I didn't have all this experience with Linux, then like, would it, I mean, thanks to all my experience with Linux, I know how to deploy services. So Linux gave me a lot of experience and how to package things and how to do the pipeline and how to deliver stuff. So I use that knowledge every day working for the man. So ne ne next slide. So let's talk about Linux and not so much about me. <laughs> so where we are with Linux is, uh, I mean, Linux is pretty dominant on mobile. I mean, if you count Android. I mean, who uses Android here? Probably no one. Wow. There's some losers. I mean, Linux users. <laughs> no, I'm, what? Huh? It's not? Well, I, I, to be honest, I just, I just pulled this number out of ChatGPT. It's for real, right? <laughs> Well, I, I personally, I, I use iOS like an absolute hypocrite, but, I, so what is the real number for mobile, you think? 50? Less? Uh, not, okay, whatever. Just imagine it being high, okay? <laughs> and imagine it being more high on servers. Would, would, is this number for real? Oh, jeez, thank you. Thank you. So, like, Linux is, is absolutely dominant on, on servers. And, um, but it's only like 2% on desktop. And like everyone, it's, it's an absolute meme, isn't it? Like Linux on desktop, year of the desktop. It's never gonna happen, is it? But like at the same time, um, I hope none of you think that this is like, oh, I'm not gonna use it. Uh, no, it's just 2%, and it's not worth touching. No, no, I think, I think there's, uh, running Linux on the desktop has been the big enabler for me. If I didn't run Linux on my desktop, I wouldn't know how to do half the things I, I know how to do, or even 99% of the things I know how to do. I, 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 I mean, Linux is hard. The, the learning curve is horrible. Um, and the whole ecosystem is a bit, is a bit freaking crazy. But if you run Linux every day on your computer, you'll pick it up, and you'll be, and you'll be Linux savvy in no time. And like, what, I, I think someone was just was, was, uh, like deriding KDE, like, KDE, GNOME, so awful. But like people forget what this is. Does anyone know what this is? It's Conqueror. It's Conqueror. And what did Conqueror uh, give birth to? And that gave birth to? And that gave birth to? What? Link. Yeah, exactly. WebKit is actually a huge project nowadays. It powers the web. It's on every freaking device ever. So, so people like, you know, like, the, I met the KDE developers in Deb, DebConf. You know, now they're like, I think it's amazing to have a have a piece of software that you work on, like WebKit. I mean, it's deployed on every device ever, isn't it? I mean, let's be honest. WebKit is ubiquitous, just like Linux, or probably more ubiquitous. So, so I hope you, you don't you see this as an opportunity. Seriously, don't. Uh, yeah, have uh, next slide. So, what makes Linux great? Um, okay, it's open source. It's kind of like got a GPL license, which is kind of unusual nowadays. Uh, I, do you know what even GPL is? It's like you're supposed to contribute back. But to be honest, most people who, who clone down Linux and build it for their stupid um, hardware probably don't, don't do, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but um, you should contribute back, and a lot of big companies do. Google does, Intel does, and all the big. Oh, really? I haven't even paid it, but. But uh, what? Yeah, Lego. Got Lego? Damn right! All that plastic shit polluting the world. <laughs> Black that out. Uh, open source. So, I think Linus himself said that like licensing Linux under the GPL was the best decision that he ever made. I mean, I find that a bit weird, because I'm more of a I'm more of an MIT license kind of guy. But yeah, it's open source, so you you can just use it for whatever you want, whatever. But be mindful that you should publish the stuff uh, back. Um, the the, another great thing about Linux is the compatibility. 
Okay, this is a bit complicated because you get glibc and libc, and I don't even know if you guys even know the difference between muscle. Do you, have you guys heard of muscle C and glibc? Yeah. Okay, so, well, anyway, Linux compatibility has been pretty rock solid over the years. If you have a static binary from, I don't know, 10 years ago, it should have run on a, on a, on a 2023 Linux. I think it hasn't changed for a very long time. Another great thing about Linux is the fact that I, I'm a huge mono repo kind of guy, and every time I, I, I hear microservices at work, I'm just going, ooh, no, no. I want everything in one repo, like how to do it properly. And of course, um, Linus himself uh, wrote uh, Git, and uh, let's be honest, Git is pretty rad, except maybe learning it kind of sucks, but. Git is a huge, huge uh, part of my life, I would say. Uh, you all using Git, right? Jesus Christ, I really hope you are. I really hope you are. <laughs> SVN, CVS. Um, OK, we all know the community is huge. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's stable. It's flexible. I think I talked about that before. The Unix heritage, yeah, like um, it's great that everyone's using this, this, this Linux kernel, which is like got familiar Unix um, connotations to it. Oh, never mind. There are like some cool technology in in uh, in Linux, and f and for me, the coolest technology is the file system. The file system has always been much faster than FAT32, much faster than NTFS, and what the fuck the Mac OS one is called? <laughs> it's bullshit. EXT is rocking, honestly. It is so crazy fast. Like, you just put it on the same hardware. You'd be surprised. Like, oh my god, it's fast. And, uh, and, and Linux, I think, has got some schedule improvements. But for me, if someone was going to say, what's the best technology about Linux, I would say the file system has always just blown me away. And, and Docker. Who can forget Docker? Oh my god. Uh, Docker is native, C groups. I'll get onto that. Um, OK, next slide. So this is where. I've struggled with Linux. Um, yeah. I don't know about your experience of Linux. There's not that many. How many Linux users are there? Like five. This is embarrassing. Um, I mean, it is pretty hard to get into Linux, but and I personally have, have, have my issues. Like, for example, Linux updates practically every freaking day on Arch Linux. Do you update? Yeah. Every day? Yeah. You guys are. Pretty lifeless. <laughs> no, I want to do some work, man. Um, I don't want to worry about uh, uh, Linux updates all the time. I, I find it quite irritating. Because, and th then also what I find is that when you uh, update Linux, then often the modules that you might use later, like USB modules, they get loaded, and then they're, then the wrong version, and there's some crap going on, and you have to reboot because you, your machine becomes unstable. <sighs> so. I don't like that part about Linux, that it's like so crazy, even, to, even in 2023. It's been that way for years. I also find it very, ch I've, I, I've been a long time user of Linux, as you know, like 20 years or something. And I often find it very difficult to report and diagnose the issues. I find Bugzilla terrible. I don't know about what your experience is. I hate it. So I've never really, I, I, you know, the, the first, one of the first things I tell uh, noobs like yourselves is write a bug report. And to be honest, I haven't got a single bug report in my name, I think, under, in, in Bugzilla. I don't think there is. Um, another thing that I never really quite got with, um, Linux, uh, with Linux is like the dev system. I think it's now like the sys system. But if you're using old school utilities, or is it old school? <laughs> I don't know. If you're using like a tracing utility, You'll find that the way Linux uses um, devices is not how, you, how I expect it to be used, used. Like, for example, the Unix philosophy is that you open a, a, a device, like dev video or something like that. You read from it. But the way that Linux does a lot of things, I think it's more performance focused. It does a lot of this like memory setting and memory getting. It reads, it reads direct memory all the time. I mean, I'm probably talking bullshit, but that's my experience. Slash boot has always been a bit weird. That's like, it always has to be FAT32. FAT32, for Christ's sake, why? Why can't it be EXT4? Um, it's, yeah, because of EF5, probably. But yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, thanks for answer. I always wondered. No, <laughs> I, I kind of knew that. Um, I've, I've never actually contributed anything to Linux, I would say, to the core project. I, I did, I was messing around with 
with the idea of doing it, but then I thought to myself, do I really want to do it? Because it's quite an investment of time and energy. And let's be honest, it's like, I think that there are like Linux developers like uh, Linus, Alan Cox, Greg, uh, th th yeah, there's probably a few that get paid quite well for doing their job, but there are literally thousands who don't. And sometimes I wonder to myself, is it worth me spending time on this sort of stuff? Uh, um, anyway, you should. Don't, 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 don't take me. It's just, this, these are my personal failings, by the way. Uh, I often find the proc command line a bit weird, too. It's like th that's the way of passing arguments to the kernel. I wish it was a little bit more expressive. So these are my own little failings. And um, oh, you probably have worse ones, I hope. Uh, any complaints about Linux? Well, that's, that's, that's a different thing. I, I, I don't want to get onto that. <laughs> Next. Oh, okay. So things that bother me too. Um, so my philosophy about computing in general is less code. I, I know you probably go to university and, and someone will, will intelligently say to you, SLOC doesn't matter. Source lines of code, that's a poor metric for judging uh, uh, code quality. It's the worst one. It's got so many bad problems with it. Yes. SLOC is extremely flawed way of, of, uh, of determining uh, software quality, but it's actually a pretty damn good one at the same time. Right now, we're looking at about 40 million, in fact, depending on the tool you use, maybe 50 million lines of code. It's a huge project. If I ever work with somebody who has a million lines of code, I'm getting like, oh, God, oh, God, shit. <laughs> this is 50 million lines of code. And if you click that, if you open that one, the, I mean, you don't need to do that, actually. You can see that the growth is pretty linear. I guess it's safe to say in 2025, it's going to be, you know, or six, it's going to be 60 million lines of code. I honestly don't think it's sustainable. I really don't. Um, you guys might differ, and there might be some good counter uh, um, uh, arguments to be made. Next. I did want to point out the alternatives, because um, they've influenced me a lot too. In University of Helsinki, despite the ho being the, the home of Linux, I learned about Plan 9. And just to give you some, um, give you like a, some what do you call it, some contrast, I think the, the Plan 9 kernel, okay, it doesn't have much hardware support, but it's about 10,000 10, lines of code or something like that. You can boot in a VMware or something. 10,000 lines of code, and it's got some very interesting concepts. And if you, I, I included the, uh, do, you, do you know what that is? Yeah. I included the GoFit, it might, it might look kind of similar, right? Yeah, hmm. Same guys behind Plan 9 are behind Go, so this is why I'm a big fan of Go. And then another, uh, uh, what do you call it, operating system that's pretty popular is, is BSD. And BSD has given birth to uh, Mac OS, so and, and I, I would say a lot of the core um, internet infrastructure, I know it's like 97% Linux, but I would say the other 2% are probably BSD machines, right? And who uses BSD here? No one. One, half. No, not really. So the, just, just also, just for a, a data point, I think last time I slocked uh, the sys directory in FreeBSD, it's about um, a million lines of code. So. BSD, and, but it's kind of confusing because BSD uses a lot of drivers from Linux and uh, whatever. But nonetheless, I think it's 1 million is a lot less than 40 million or 50 million, right? Just to give you some, something to think about. Um, so that's BSD. Um, maybe I'll talk about that a bit, a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> so here are my thoughts about, about Linux and the future. I often think that Linus is probably of a different generation where he might get cancelled by saying that you suck at programming or something like that. Um, he's not that bad. I mean, I think, I think what he has to say is personally very good. But unfortunately, the tone and things like this on, on mailing lists are usually just terrible. In fact, no one seems to use mailing lists anymore, so whatever. Um, I encourage you, I mean, you guys are all probably young hotheads. I'm, I used to write pretty bad emails to people. I, all, I, all I encourage you to do is please speak to the person 
um, before writing that email, or just don't write that email. Take a freaking break. But I think, yeah, the, the, actually Linus's emails are pretty sensible. But I often think to myself that if Linus, I don't know, gets canceled or, or disappears, the project might suffer for it, right? Um, the, the next thought I had was about hardware. Like, so hardware, um, hardware support in Linux is fantastic. It's the best. Way better than Windows or anything else. But at the same time, um, that could be its undoing. Because the more things you support, the more you have to support them. And you might support bad, um, bad technology. Like I think, I think it was hyper-threading. Hopefully this was right. Maybe, maybe you have to censor that. I think that allowed people to accidentally look at memory. You know, there's been some CPU bugs. And Linux happily uh, implements that. And then, it, and, and, and then that sort of jeopardizes security. Oh, oh, crap. So the hardware situation could change a lot. And we might see cons consolidation. Like, for example, uh, the days of x86 might be numbered. Because x86 is an absolute complexity nightmare. You want to use something simpler, like, you know, like ARM. We might see everything go to ARM in, in a few years. So in the sense, like all, a lot of um, Lin Linux's value add about supporting all sorts of esoteric hardware, the, all that esoteric hardware might, might not be relevant. Anyway, it's just a thought. I think I've talked about complexity because, yes, SLOC matters. Complexity of, the, of Linux uh, code base is, is quite phenomenal. I think we recently saw that Linux is accepting contributions by Rust. I think that's probably a good thing, right? Um, because if you ever look at the security, uh, whatever, the CVEs of Linux and stuff, most of them are like memory type issues, I think. So if Linux, uh, the Rust borrow checker can solve the, the, the memory issues, that'd be great. So yeah, I think the languages advances are very timely. And to, speaking of timely, AI tools, like it's not inconceivable that you could handle millions of lines of code with the help of chat GPT. Or it could be an absolute train wreck. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> but AI tools could make you superhuman to, and, uh, to allow you to maintain more code easier. Maybe. Maybe. I did also just want to mention that I think, I, I mean, I haven't done the survey, but I, I'm willing to bet that most Linux maintainers are quite old. Don't forget. Um, next thing is that Google has its own uh, kernel called Fusia. I don't know how to say that. How do you say that? Okay, whatever. But it's been going. It's been going for a number of years, and I think they had the most layoffs of any division lately. And I, I often think if you guys can't get, I mean, Linus himself got uh, Linux out the door in a, on one week. If you can't get a, a kernel out the door in, the, in in three years, I think maybe something's going wrong. <laughs> I would be pretty pissed if I didn't have a working kernel after one week. Um, oh, yeah, and there's a risk that perhaps the, the kernel just might be treated as something like kind of generic and boring and, and, you know, it's nothing very interesting. I mean, are you, any of you guys interested in the kernel or working with it as, as the top academics in your country? Um, that's fucking worrying. You don't have the brain. Oh, please. If I have the brains to do something, you have. Honestly, you just need to ha give it a try. Yeah, like, what, is there any project you want to contribute to, open source wise? Uh, don't, oh god, guys. Not either. What? <laughs> you should be aiming for, oh my god. Okay, that proves my point. That proves my point. But there, there are very much, things that can be innovated on, like going back to plan nine, something you've probably never heard of. I do encourage you to have a look at that. But you, we could have APIs that are, are quite different from, from what we are used to in Linux. Like, for example, with plan nine, you have this like network file system where you can basically mount resources on, on other network machines. So you can basically uh, send your process to be computed on another CPU. This stuff is kind of mind-blowing concepts that you can do with, um, with a simple operating system like Plan 9, but you can't do it on Linux. There isn't that much groundbreaking innovation in Linux, I feel, sometimes. Or, or maybe just kernel development. But there are some ideas out there that you sh if you're hopefully interested and you should have a look at. Uh, plan 9, the 9P protocol, uh, for example. 
maybe go to the next one. So this is kind of like my main slide. I mean, the way I, I think of, of Linux, especially like I, I'm working for the public sector, I'm working for banks and things like this, and you know how it is when you work for some companies. Security is number one. Well, why the fuck are you running Linux then? It's, uh, <laughs> it's a problem, uh, I think, because um, the track record with, with security in, in, in Linux is actually not great. In fact, Linus himself basically suggests that every bug is a potential security bug. So whenever um, some security researcher goes to him and says, oh, I found a bug, it's a bug. It's a fucking bug. Who cares? Um, which, which I can understand, but at the same time, it, I think Linux can only handle that because of its momentum, right? It's probably not the best idea going forward, but who knows if uh, th things can change. Like, I, the reason why I put upside down Docker there is because like Docker is one of those things where I think people think that it makes things more secure, right? I can run it in the container. It's gonna be super secure. Uh, actually, Docker has made no security guarantees about stuff running in this, in this container it's really not nearly as secure as like a BSD jail. Like seriously, it's a, it's a joke in my, it's a mean to me uh, to make uh, security assertions with Linux because you can't. It's just too complex and too messy, right? Um, uh, unless someone can correct me saying I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean to be honest, um, I, f I find like, I, I, is any of you guys security researchers that look at CVEs? I think CVEs is also a bit weird because, okay, let's not get into CVEs. But the surface area is a lot less with BSD, and BSD has made lots of efforts to make it secure. It, it, it is way more secure. But at the same time, when you, whenever, if you ever install BSD, you're like, oh, um, this is slow. <laughs> or like, oh, my USB is not working properly? Oh, shit. Well, that's BSD. You ha you're limited. Um, you're, you're, there's a lot less things available to you. But I thought, I, who knows who this guy is? All oh, right. So, he's another famous South African. He's not Elon Musk, of course. He's uh, Theo Durat. He's one, the one of the main guys behind BSD. So BSD has lots of very, very good uh, technology to make it secure. So. So ultimately, like when people, I don't know, security just bugs me, like oh, security researchers. I mean, seriously, if you really care about security, you'll be running BSD, like seriously. And that's, and that's, what, that's how, I, how I, what do you call it? That's how I make the trade-offs in my mind between the kernels. Like if I, if I was really cared about security, I would run BSD. But if I really like cool, shiny, shiny, and I do because I run Linux, uh, you would you go Linux, but 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 guys, don't be hoodwinked. Um, there are some real concerns here, um, so it's something to be mindful of. But it's got the momentum, so the bugs are going to get fixed quickly. <laughs> um, I think the next slide is oh, I use I use ArchLinux, so there's like one or two ArchLinux users, and I wish um, and. The reason why I have this slide is, is that Arch Linux is probably not the most advanced or the most interesting uh, Linux distribution, but I think it's like the easiest. Like the package manager is simple. I mean, it's not easiest to use, right? If you want an easy to use operating system, use Windows, I guess. <laughs> but Arch Linux, I think, has a very understandable package manager, Pac-Man, and um, the, 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 the packaging with package build is quite simple. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest you use NixOS unless you've got some years of, of Arch Linux under your belt, because NixOS is like got quite a few new ideas, and I think if you don't really know the basics that you would get from Arch Linux, Arch Linux you, you would probably um, suffer with NixOS. Nix but, Jesus, guys don't look very excited. <laughs> but please, give Arch Linux a try, and I've got some stickers um, that you can stick on your laptop, and. And maybe, maybe you'll, win, you'll win some friends. Who knows? <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah. And the next one is just the slide of, yeah. of how to con okay, yeah, to how to contact me. Um, I, do, I want you to keep this, this presentation kind of targeted on Linux, but the Linux ecosystem has a lot more to it, you know, Wayland, X, um, web. And my career isn't limited to Linux. I, I have, Linux has basically been the fertile ground to a lot of learnings and a lot of, uh, and a launch bed to my career. So, oh, go, I mean, don't need to go back a slide, but like, like guys, if, if you really want to stand out in your career, if you want to, I mean, it's a competitive market, there's been a lot of, uh, what do you call them, retrenchments, fire, what do you call these things? Uh, firings, whatever. If you want to, if you want to get an advantage, um, I'm, I, I, I know some, I know some people in the industry or hiring engineering managers. If you can show that you have some Linux experience, your CV, I promise you, will float to the top. Because, because learn, learning Linux isn't easy. It shows that you've had some initiative, and you're going to be working with Linux inadvertently. I'm sorry to say, even if you don't use it on your on your on your laptop. So I really encourage you, as uh, as NUS as, as students, to um, to give Linux a, a real hard try. I mean, computers are a lot cheaper than they were when I was a kid. I'm sure you can get a second-hand ThinkPad for like 500 sing or something. Install Arch on it. Have fun. What? No, I don't have any Red Hat certs. No, I, I, do, I do have AW sets in, in, full, in full confession, but the Red Hat ones, yeah, I don't know. What, what, whatever gets you there, I guess. I'm not going to dismiss it, uh, dismiss it out, but, but uh, give, give Linux a try. And feel free to contact me if, you, if you're stuck or something. I'd, I probably will ignore it, but uh, <laughs> no, I won't. Email me, and uh, I'll try to help. I'll try to help you. Okay, that's it. Any questions? <laughs> Stickers are here. So, okay, just you can so, pass it around. Right? So now we'll be doing the Q and A session. So, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Oh, oh, hang, yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, Well, I've, I've told you before, I don't value my education very highly. I value the people that I met. I mean, that's why I have pictures of people instead of my textbooks. I mean, no, I have my textbooks there, too. <laughs> so, so, so the point was, like, theoretically, nothing? Theoretically, not a lot. Um, no, not a lot. I mean, like, some things, I mean, there were some courses. I mean, you guys have probably done, like, a basic compilers course. And, like, when you, like, for some reason, when I was a, a fresh grad, I was like, oh, a compiler, that's just mysterious. But when you learn a typical compiler's course will, will teach you, you know, how to tokenize stuff, and, uh, you know, it kind of makes you a little bit more confident about things. So, but to be honest, I don't remember anything. I, most, most of the things I learned was just by, by, um, by learning how to do it myself with, with the help of a community, to be honest. Yeah. What do you mean, not that hard? What do you mean, it's not that, yeah. No, you don't. No, you don't have to be, like, I, I think I had, the, I had the same, what do you call that? What do you call that? What do you call it when you don't believe in yourself? Or, I don't know. I, I, was, I was always just thinking that I sucked and things like this. But it didn't, for some reason, it didn't stop me. I just tried. You don't have to be super smart. I mean... Who are these people? I don't even know them. The Temple OS guy. The Temple OS? Yeah, he made his own OS and programming languages together. Well, I mean, if, it, if you want to do that, go for it. But, but like, most of device drivers are quite simple, you know, and they should be. Um, I think if you want, like, if I, I like to think that if I could make my own operating system, anyone can. I mean, I'm, I'm not the smartest cookie in the shed. <laughs> I just, I'm just quite determined to, to see it through. The, the, actually, the, the biggest quality, I would say, is just like 
typing well and having a stamina to get through the, the, all the issues you're going to get through. Having the stomach. Because I couldn't have pulled off like Web Converger if I just didn't have the focus. And nowadays, you, you guys probably are distracted by about 10 different instant messengers, three different AI bots, um, I don't know, notifications here, there, and everywhere. I mean, it's, it's hard. But you don't have to be especially smart to get there, for Christ's sake. The fact that you're in this chair in NUS means that you're probably smart enough, honestly. Oh, I can't even apply. You can't even apply? What, to NUS? You're not a student. Well, prove them wrong. <laughs> Write some software, man. Any other questions? Oh, <laughs> well, I did boast that the hardware support was excellent under Linux, but the truth is it isn't <laughs> for, for GPUs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Like, I've, to be honest, I've given up on gaming on Linux. But at the same time, there was a guy at work the other day that had a Steam Deck, and I thought to myself, that works quite well. And it runs Arch, exactly. So... I mean, gaming on Linux is, um, what does PlayStation run? Doesn't PlayStation run like some weird Linux? Uh, yeah, you can. I believe you can. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Well, I personally don't game anymore because I have kids and I'm just too busy. But uh, I, think, I think it's got potential. But unfortunately, the NVIDIA, I think, are still, I, I think they're getting better, but they still kind of suck, don't they? Yeah, I haven't even actually really given Wayland a good try yet. I spent all of yesterday installing the NVIDIA driver. And? I succeeded. Well, that's, <laughs> but, did it, but did it work? I'm not using it for this layout. Yeah. You know, fun, funny enough, in Debian, um, one of the guys I was kind of friendly with, he maintained the NVIDIA I'm spreading a rumor here, but I think, it, just cut this out. The, the rumor is kind of, kind of funny if it's real. Uh, he maintained the NVIDIA uh, driver, but like I, I complained to him, hey, this doesn't work for gaming. He says, I don't use this G NVIDIA GPU for gaming. I use it for mining. I was like, what's mining? <laughs> <laughs> and this is like years ago. Uh, I think he did, I haven't seen him around for a very long time. I think he's, he's probably retired with a few girls in his, this mansion in Puerto Rico or something? <laughs> yeah, it's a money thing, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, uh, e even where Linux, even where, yeah, so gaming, I think it's still, it's, it's a thing. I mean, people shouldn't be so bothered about Linux dominance. I think it, it, you should just see it as a way of, of, of having fun and, and being independent and doing your own thing. Because just imagine we live in a world where Microsoft you know, was the corporation, you had to like uh, download Windows to run your operating system, you couldn't actually see uh, or anything under it, or you couldn't actually toggle the privacy thing, it would be a nightmare. We're living in a fantastic world with lots of opportunity, really. Maybe, maybe both at the same time, but if you want to take the, was it the blue pill or the red pill? Whatever. <laughs> if you want to take the red pill, you can, and I encourage you to do so. And that's, that's actually, that, that's good enough for me. I don't care if most people don't do that, as long as I can, and whoever wants to, whoever wants to try. Any other questions? Yeah. You use Arch, though. Uh huh. Uh huh. Have you tried Fedora? Yeah, I have. Fedora is like, like a shrink wrapped experience type thing. I guess the same with Ubuntu. I mean, they have their vision, and I think Fedora is pretty good. If you, I. I sometimes look at it because, like, oh, how have they integrated system CTL? I mean, I can learn things from their distribution. So I, I, I often look at distributions and learn a lot. It's a hotbed of ideas all over the place. And, and yeah, Fedora is the best one for system CTL and all that sort of stuff. System D, system D sorry. The reason I ask is Fedora actually solves one of your biggest problems. Oh, what's that? With a boot? The DNS offline upgrade. Oh, really? Oh. It will download the updates, but it will only install them when you reboot. 
Oh, interesting. Mm. Okay, okay. I mean, NixOS also solves this problem, I think. Um, but that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's been there's been attempts at this uh, the solution for a while. Like there was K-Splice about ten years ago. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but uh, they're never great solutions. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, as you can, uh, hopefully the message is that you don't have to be awesome. You can just muddle your way through it like I have, okay? <laughs> but way really easy in the back? Oh, well, come on, man. There's been some great innovation, like tiling window managers. <laughs> how, do you, how do people use Mac OS? Honestly, it's awful. Tiling window managers is the bomb. So don't be... Don't, don't dismiss it. I mean, as I said, Linux is just a, a hotbed of ideas, just or a fertile ground for it, at least. Okay, that's it, guys. Now, I'm sure you're all hungry. So, so thanks, Kai, for giving this yeah. talk. Okay, I'm out of here. Okay, so welcome back. Sorry for the technical, there was a technical difficulty. Uh, anyway, uh, for the second session, we are inviting Ming Liang to share about his PhD application. So, yeah, all right, thank you. Um, okay, thanks everybody for coming. So today I'll just be talking kind of like my PhD journey for the, that I've been really been working on for like the entire of my undergraduate. So it's like a four year thing. So, a little bit about myself is that um, I'm just, uh, all right. is that basically um, I'm in my final year right now, and I have been working on AI research for a very long time, actually since pre-university, so since 2017, and I've worked with a lot of people since then, especially during my time undergraduate, uh, like Harold Solt, which was what I did in first year, Jonathan Scarlett, who's a bit of a theorist, and Kevin Murphy from Google AI, and MTS Khan as of late, which is from Riken. So I've worked with a lot of people. And my main body of work that I've been working on for like these few years has really been about theory and foundational algorithms, right? Like kind of very fundamental things that we take for granted, like for example, gradient descent and understanding their properties and stuff like that. And of course, you know, that's about me. So like, because I don't think I'm, many of you know me and I haven't taken like a lot of CS classes uh, formally. Uh, basically, I'll just highlight some of the notable things I did. So I published a paper in year one, that was uh, that right there from ICLR, International Conference of Learning Representation, right? Uh, where I worked on the theory of optimal transport. So that was very popular and still is a very huge area of research now. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Wasserstein Gen, but that's the foundational theory of Wasserstein Gen was optimal transport. Uh, I've also contributed to textbooks. Uh, this is a textbook for CS5340, Uncertainty Modeling AI. You can find my name there in the acknowledgments. I worked on, uh, yeah, so I didn't feel the need to take that class after contributing to the textbook. <laughs> because, yeah, uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, so that was a very fun class. So that was a very fun book to work on. So that was when I worked with Google, in Google Sum of Code. Uh, that was in um, year two summer. And then finally, I've been working on, as of late, in, um, Travel overseas into Japan and Riken, which has been really nice to sponsor me. And that was me uh, over there with the research group. So um, a bit about the conclusions of my entire process. So I've been working on this for four years and really been AI research for a long time. So these are my offers that I've gotten. I've gotten a lot of rejections as well, which I didn't post. In fact, I can tell you I got rejected from majority of like the US schools. And I'll did remark about why I got why I think I got rejected. I don't know exactly know why, but I have theories for why. So these are the schools I got accepted to. Um, yeah, and my goal of this talk is really to kind of demystify the whole admissions process because I don't think a lot of people talk about it. Uh, or rather, don't, people who talk about it usually are like professors who have really made it all the way up and not a lot of students kind of in the process or just finish the process like myself give talks about it. So we give a like, kind of like a less biased view, right? So, this is aligned to my kind of my second thing, which I talk about, which is kind of like a meta advice. There are two big problems with this, like I said, that's what I'm trying to address with this talk. Survivorship bias, 
because professors survive the system. That's why they are there, they're professors. And because they usually give advice, we usually have a very biased opinion about how the PhD process is like, because for them, you know, they're professors, right? They mean it all to be there. Um, and second of all, there's this other, a little less known principle, it's called the Anna Karina principle, which comes from statistical um, uh, theory. And basically, it's basically saying, you know, it's a very simple quote. Uh, basically, it says, all happy families are alike, even, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So the statistics, the idea is, every properly done study is alike, but every study that is, you know, poorly done is different in its own way, because all the statistical assumptions, one of them breaks, and they will all break in usually slightly different ways. So the same things here with success and all these kind of PhD applications. I think most successful people who have done through academia are all fairly similar, right? But those who are not that successful are unsuccessful in slightly different ways from each other. I don't know where I fall into this scale, but I would like to think that I have done some things right and some things not right. And I hope by giving this talk, I kind of give at my own experience as a data point for all of you guys. Okay, so let's start at the beginning, right? So why do you want to do a PhD in the first place is a big question. <laughs> and I think that, okay, the ultimate purpose of a PhD is to train scientists. And there's a big difference between liking science and actually doing science. And, you know, actually doing science is a lot less glamorous as you might think. It's a lot less about necessarily knowing things and actually being able to solve problems, go through the process, read the literature, a lot more other things. And that shift from being a fan of science, somebody who likes the classes they take, does well in the classes they've done, they pick the chosen, to actually doing research is a massive shift. And I'm sure many people have done very well in their classes for when they apply PhD, but when they actually do their PhD, they actually do research, they might find, oh, it's very, very different. Right, I think NUS has a lot of opportunities to try to do research, like Europe's, like an FYP, right? That's great because it helps you understand this gap between doing well in classes and doing research, okay? And on top of that, you know, a PhD is not, you know, purpose is to train scientists. So if you don't want to be a scientist, it's a bit of a thing. There's all a huge opportunity cost towards doing a PhD. And I think my friend, you know, Jet Neil here, really summarized the difference between choosing a path in industry versus doing a PhD very well. <laughs> yeah. So another thing is that, okay, once you decided, oh, yeah, I know, I think a PhD is good, I want to be a scientist, how do you, uh, what do you need to look out for? So one thing you need to look out for just before you apply is to also start looking at different professors' websites. So this is something I recommend all of you, if you're interested in PhD, to do. Go to the faculty members that you're interested in. So these people, how do you determine them? If you're into research, you probably read a few papers. You probably, after a while reading a few papers, you notice, hey, this name comes out a lot. If this name comes out a lot, just Google the person's name. And then they turn out to be maybe some professor or going to be a professor. So you check out their website, and then they will tell you some information. So this is an important step because professors might sometimes say on their website, they are not hiring anyone. So do not apply to these labs, okay? So these are two examples of it. Uh, this professor in the, right here, he is hiring nobody right here. He's a very famous guy who created the neuro OD paper, neuro ordinary differential equations, ordinary differential equations. So you might want to check that out for those interested. But yeah, he in his own website, he says zero chances. He's not hiring anybody. And of course, some of you might think of emailing. Emailing is fine. In fact, it's highly recommended if you are going to the UK uh, and Europe in general. But in the US, as you can even read their, email, their own uh, website, they might tell you to not. So please read email, uh, check their website before to know who's hiring. So this is necessary before PhD process because you have an end goal. So once you decided, I want to do a PhD, you have these people, so you have an end goal in mind. What labs, what places you're applying to. You can see. One big important difference when I mention this is that you're not applying to schools, you're applying to laboratories. Because a PhD is a really like a job process, right? Don't just apply to a university because it's a fancy name like Cambridge or Harvard. Check out which labs you want to apply to. Okay. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And that is exactly what I 
uh, I think I uh, don't know where I wrote that, but yeah, exactly what, what he said. PhD is really like apprenticeship. It's learning, it's, a, it's part of the journey towards becoming an actual scientist, right? There is, and we need to go through this apprenticeship because there is a lot of knowledge involved in doing research that cannot be codified, explained, like in language, so you have to do it. That's why an apprenticeship system is very important. And um, that's also why this looking at these people, your supervisor, the faculty members, and the labs you're going to is important because they're your master. <laughs> you need to check them out first. Yeah, exactly. So there are a few factors to a PhD application that is really important. And I think that these are the big three that in my mind, which is research experiences, recommendation letters, and developing uh, some kind of personal connection with them. Uh, okay, so these are the ones I think are big in your control. There are still, like, other things that are not in your control, but I think these are the big ones that are somewhat within your control. And at various stages of your PhD like goal process, you might be in control, you might not be in control of some of that. For example, if you're applying, let's say, in a month's time, chances are you cannot increase the amount of research experience you have significantly, right? Same thing with recommendation letters. But you might be able to, with some luck, connect with the right people and then um, develop some kind of personal connections like through email and stuff. So this is something that happens quite ad hoc. So I don't know. So the third one is something that's very ad hoc. It's really luck based. You have to be, maybe you just happen to be, you know, you happen to have a, you happen to, your paper suddenly got accepted to a conference and then you uh, suddenly got a chance to meet them. So this is the third one, developing is the most ad hoc way. Um, so, but still within your control, even within a month. So, but my point, my point is, I think these are the three big ones, and I think that there are some that I didn't include, which I think is worth mentioning. For example, I think that uh, one of the things I think is that grades beyond, let's say, the first class honors, isn't as important as many people think. The difference between somebody who is 4.9 versus 5.0, a 4.9 who has published a paper is far more valuable than a 5.0 who has never published a paper. I think it's something quite important. So that's why I think these are the three big ones. And I think um, grades beyond first class honors, I think, think is much of a worry after that. Um, so these ones, I, um, so many of them, uh, they've been broken down further. Like for example, research experiences, what kind of experiences you want to have. And I think there are many, many blocks which have done this very well, and I've linked them at the bottom. So these blocks at the bottom are kind of like, they are, okay, they are, to be fair, these blocks are very machine learning centric blocks. So they are really talk about the com examples they give are very like conferences in machine learning based, which may or may not interest some of you. But I think that they are very good and broadly applicable to most CS-based PhD programs. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit of each of these. So the first one let's talk about is ex research experiences. So the question about research experiences is how do you find research experiences in the first place? So there's your UROTS, you, you know, the Undergrad Research Opportunity Programs in NUS, and there is FYP, right? There's really more than these options out there, okay? And you can, NUS allows you to also work with people not from NUS, so please exploit that. So, for example, NUS has agreements with, let's say, res other research institutes overseas like Riken, which allows you to do internships and your FYP at the same time, right? And that can work within fairly well. So I did that, so that's why I can say that. <laughs> but how do you find this research experience? How do you know? Because they are not on Talent Connect, they are not on emails or anything like that. How do you find out about these things? So there are two big ones, I think, which is Twitter and emails. And the reason why Twitter is up there is because a lot of academics, uh, this is not true now exactly because Elon Musk bought over Twitter and a lot of people left Twitter. They will now have a Matsudon instead, I believe that's how you pronounce. Mastodon, I <laughs> can never pronounce the name, but Mastodon. So that's another option. So. Uh, yeah, so Twitter and Mastodon are places where they, sometimes people will be like saying, hey, I have an intern position or I need research assistance here. Email them, see where it goes. Sometimes it leads to new opportunities. So this is how I got my FYP one. I worked on Twitter and yeah, and also email. So that's my Herald, so I just uh, via email, right? So the big idea here isn't these, uh, there's a bigger principle here, right? Which is when it comes to this kind of finding research opportunities, reach out to people professors are interested in NUS, people, other academics around the world, and keep an eye out for opportunities, right? And most importantly, don't fear rejection, because I think the chances of you getting rejected are a lot lower than you think. 
meaning people are generally prone to replying emails. Okay, I think this is uh, far, um, far more, uh, <laughs> like you would think that, oh, 99% of people reject you. No, actually I think like, maybe only like, maybe like 20% of people, the most people would reply to your emails. Uh, as long as you personalize your emails, okay? Condition on the fact that you personalize emails, I think this is true. Okay, so that being said, how do you personalize? How do you construct your emails properly? And how do you even, maybe even this broadly, these principles broadly apply to even um, interviews, really? And that is, oops, and that is um, kind of, first of all, when you write your email, lead with value. Okay, so there's this scene in this anime called My Hero Academia, where the first one, huh? Yes, that's great. Yes, in this scene, this character, the called Deku, was trying to explain why the benefits of him getting the internship. And this guy, the person he's applying to, clearly said to him, no, you shouldn't be telling me why, I, why hiring you is a good thing for you. You should be telling me what do I gain from hiring you. That's very important. This leads to the second, uh, first point, lead with value. Explain to people why hiring you helps them. Right? Don't just explain why does this benefit you. Explain to people why hiring you, why getting you on board as a research assistant as an intern helps you. Second of all is to show your work. So a lot of people do not appreciate the value of creating things like a personal website on GitHub and things like that, which are really, really simple to do these days with a lot of templates. Do that. Put your work out there. Put your work on Twitter. Put your work on GitHub. Make the work easy to find and for people to easily find it. Right? This is a good way of like getting people to know, oh, you did something really cool. This is the link. And maybe they will even find you through that. Right? So you need to put out there and show your work. Right? Not just show the final product, but also sometimes even showing how you get to the final product. And I think that's valuable because it shows people how you think. And you know, that's far more valuable to me than your end product. Because sometimes you get an end product, you're like, what do you do in this end product? Like for example, you made a paper, you wrote, you, you contributed to a paper. What are your contributions to your paper? Explain how you might have gotten there, right? And then the third one finally is uh, kind of make it easy to say yes. Uh, so uh, what does that mean is basically really simple. It's just that when you want, it, it's a bit of a difficult thing because it's a bit of an intuition kind of thing. It's about experiences. But uh, basically make it such a way that working with you is very easy. Like you maybe like uh, did a little bit of the work. And then like, it's very easy to say, oh yes, let's continue doing this, this, and this. And uh, this sort of, the third one is a bit harder to do because it requires a lot of effort first on your part before moving on. Like maybe you have taken their project on GitHub. So people publish code on GitHub, researchers publish code on GitHub. They have their code. And then they kind of, okay, maybe you make some improvements. Then you maybe write that in the email, right? Then it's very easy for them to say yes. Oh yes, you let's try this and this and this. Right? So this is an example of make it easy to say yes to working with you. Yeah, but this one needs the most amount of work out of, I feel, all these three. Okay. So once you find a research experience, like through emails, through Twitter, or whatever, you have to do the actual research process. And the actual research process is going to be very different from different people, different people. And that's because everybody's slightly different. And broadly speaking, there's this guy from CMU called Kanan uh, Crane, who wrote this uh, diagram, draw this diagram to show kind of like how the research experience is like. So this is like an emotional roller coaster of research. And it starts with maybe some new idea, you try it, doesn't really work, you try stuff, doesn't work, doesn't work, and then you like think, this will never work. And then maybe after that you have some mega insight, and then, ah, maybe the insight doesn't work. And you keep trying until you finally hit on something. Right, so research is a very long, process like that. And it's going to be different for different people. Sometimes you're very lucky. You hit on the right idea in the beginning, and then you continue. But usually it's like this. And why is this important? Even though I say it's a fun, it's fun in the sense that it's fun when you look back on it, not fun when you're doing it. <laughs> I think that's a major difference, right? It's like taking a hard class. You'll think, man, this is not fun when you're doing it. But afterwards, you can think, yeah, this is actually pretty nice. So research is a lot of ups and downs, and you, huh? It still sucks. It still sucks. <laughs> yes, it still sucks. And sometimes it just still sucks, yes. Exactly. So that happens. So 
you have to be prepared for it. And I think this is what it means. So sometimes it does that. I think the only time it really doesn't suck is when you win an award or something, <laughs> and then you get offers, and they're like, that's nice. Okay, so that being said, how would you manage yourself through the research, right? Research up and down, how do you keep yourself going? And I think there's some really useful advice that uh, my mentor from Riken, MTX, suggested. And that is the first, write your ideas down. So keep track of what you have learned. So this is very useful, actually, because always he recommends doing this is to have a title for your research project and have an abstract in mind. So you keep refining that title and abstract as you work along. This has two advantages. Uh, the first advantage is that it lets your res it consolidates your research, meaning you have a very clear idea what your project is about, so you can tell people about it. The second thing is that it lets your research be shared. If you have a draft already being done, even with a title abstract, you can immediately share it with other researchers. Like maybe you met some guy in NUS or some guy was visiting from Carnegie Mellon or MIT, just share it with them and they can maybe get feedback, right? That's very useful, right? So write your ideas down. Like from day one, you start kind of like after you have decided on a project roughly, you start writing a title, you start writing an abstract so that you always have something clear in mind that you can share and have a clear idea what a project's about. And the second one is kind of prepare slides. So I think this is also useful because, first of all, we need as scientists to communicate ideas, be it your FYP presentation, be it to other scientists. So it's a good idea to prepare slides because it's good practice in general because you need to be a good communicator. And again, this kind of like, it's like the first one is about consolidating ideas. At least for me, I think that preparing slides kind of makes it easier for me to like eventually see how my ideas link. Okay, and these two ideas, advice is also kind of reiterated uh, from a different guy, not uh, from this guy, or uh, in like two Microsoft research kind of like YouTube videos, which really delves in deep into how as a scientist you can prepare your slides and how you should prepare your draft as, because you need to write papers at the end of the day. So I link these both things here and you can just watch them. They're like one hour long each. So it's not a simple thing that I'm, expect, I'm gonna explain how to do more. You can just watch these videos and I think they explain it far better than I do, okay? And something related to that, which is about writing and communicating, is that after you gain these research experiences, after maybe you go through, you got win some awards or you publish some papers, you kind of need to consolidate all your different research direct projects together into a very important document that showcases your research experiences. Your personal statement or statement of purpose, right? Oops. Statement of purpose. And the statement of purpose is a very hard thing to write because you might have a lot of experiences or you may have none. <laughs> One of these two things. And then you'll find either way you will find it difficult to write. Okay, because if you have nothing to write, then well stuff, and if you have too much things to write, that's you need to find out what angle you have. Um, I think it's, for me, I kind of, uh, my way of writing it is not the best, but like what this tweet is, tweet is saying. I first write it, I explained to my friend what I wrote, <laughs> and then I just went back and rewrote it in whatever I explained it to my friend, what my personal statement is. Okay, and I found that helpful. Uh, but basically the point is, start early, write drafts, explain to people what you wrote, and hopefully you keep revising it until you get something good. Uh, because of the fact that you need to get feedback as early as possible and you need to ask people, you may not have people to look at your personal statement in, like, in your immediate social circle. So there's this really good program by Berkeley called the Early Access Program, which I linked at the bottom there, which basically lets people, PhD students from Berkeley, vet through your personal statement, your statement of purpose, and your entire application, and they'll give you comments about what to work, look out for what grammar or whatever, and also how to structure your statement of purpose. And I think that's very helpful because um, not everybody has friends who are doing PhD with them, maybe most majority of them are in the industry, and having things like the Berkeley Early Access Program is kind of useful. So I link that to the bottom as well. So you can use that to refine your draft. Okay? So another thing about personal statements is that it's quite common for people to do these things like reusing letters. And I think uh, that's useful because it doesn't take it's too much time to personalize a statement of purpose to many places, but be mindful that um, this doesn't work for all places. This works mainly for the US schools, but for the UK, they will require you to write a research proposal, and then that's different because you probably want different research proposals for different labs because they different professors to work on different things. So this is something quite mindful about, uh, and I just want to bring this here because in my experience, why my taking writing my statement of purpose will take so long time is because I needed to write one for the US schools and research proposals for the UK schools. 
Okay, I definitely seem to have done the research proposals much better than my statement of purpose given that most of my places I got accepted to are from the UK. <laughs> so I find research proposals far easier than writing a statement of purpose. Uh, but yeah, but you want to be mindful of that because it will tell you how much classes you can take that semester when you're applying, or preferably even after semester. Uh, that, being, that being said, uh, there are some more resources about statement of purposes that I put here. Like, if you want examples of how to write it, there's this place with CS sort, which is just like people upload their own statement of purpose that they have wrote to get accepted to whatever schools they have. You can look at that there. And so the MIT Media Lab also kind of like have their own students release their statement of purposes that got them to MIT. Yeah. Okay. So the next one I'm going to talk about, like, you know, research experiences and how to present them in your application is recommendation letters, right? So this is the second point now. So recommendation letters, your goal is to get good and strong recommendation letters. So what are good and strong recommendation letters here? I highlighted some criteria. So this is just kind of like things you want to do. And one of the criteria you notice that is between the two. Uh, I, okay, these slides are also about references, so they're quite worthy. So that, you know, uh, because I'll upload them to my site so that you can just check them out is that you want letter writers that kind of know the lab supervisor you're applying to. Okay, please keep that in mind. So don't just anyhow choose your, le your recommendation letters, uh, those who write your recommendation letters. Try to find somebody who knows in the department your letter writer, okay? So my letter writer consists of um, you know, Harold So, Kevin Murphy, and uh, you know, MPS, right? So uh, everybody knows Kevin Murphy. So he's the one who wrote a textbook and stuff, and he's like senior staff scientist at like Google AI, right? So everybody knows him, right? So that's easy. that's one nice thing. But uh, depending on your other, um, yeah, depending on other supervisors, like in US, you need to change that. So for example, you're yeah, applying robotics, so it's a better option. Or sometimes professors are themselves very busy, so you need to know, for example, some professors are fighting for tenure. They may not be willing to write. So you need to have also backups in your recommendation letter. So something about these recommendation letters is I recommend you all start planning also early, but in a different sense, like you kind of know like who might be too busy and who might be best for what. This is why it's because of these sort of things like recommendation letters and the research experiences that you see why I recommend at the start before you even apply everything. You kind of know what labs you want to apply to and stuff like that. Okay? So yeah, so this is kind of it. So, so, so this is uh, two things that you can kind of improve, but I feel like the most important one, if you can, is a personal connection. But I have no advice for that because I think that's random, a bit of random luck. You just have to be out there, put yourself out there, and then if the people bless you, you kind of eventually know the people and then you get in. <laughs> okay, so that one is like all sorts of stories come from there. Okay, so I feel that's a bit out of control. Okay, so assuming you did all these three things, you can kind of go to an interview. So these are, I feel the big parts, your recommendation letters, your research experiences, and your statement of purpose. Once you get through these things, you kind of get through an uh, interview process, right? And I think the interview process is quite interesting. And I want to briefly talk about this because I think no, not a lot of people talk about it. And also, it's quite different from industry interviews. So in industry interviews, you have coding problems that are quite standardized, and everybody releases them to lead code, and you can actually practice them. All my PhD interviews, and even graduate schools like um, my master's program, like Cambridge, all of them were different, each in their own way. So, um, you know, Toronto, for example, had a much more uh, practical thing where you kind of have a, like a, uh, it was basically like a standard interview, like they'd ask you who you are and stuff like that, and there wasn't much of a technical component. So they would mainly ask you your interest in a project. So they propose you projects and you say your interest in them, how you might contribute, that kind of thing. So it tests more of your ability to be a researcher kind of thing. Uh, Imperial is interesting because Imperial is most like a coding interview in the sense that it was kind of like they give you an assignment to do, so it's one day to sort an assignment, and it was like four questions. The standard of the questions were about a typical like 5K class kind of question, so you shouldn't be expecting like 3244 kind of questions, right? <laughs> okay, just wait. You shouldn't be expecting like a basic intro to ML questions. You should be expecting at least like a 5340 kind of, or 5339 standard kind of questions, and they will be fairly non-textbook-wise, so you have to spend time thinking about how you would solve them. So um, that interview, like they will usually, it's like a typical tech interview, so there'll be like some questions you can do, some questions that are a bit more original, and a lot of it is about think, talking through your thinking process. So in those kind of interviews, you want to be like typical tech interviews, uh, explain your solution, don't just say your solution, okay? Uh, Cambridge is similar, but that one was more textbook, so that was the, 
the person interviewed me wrote the Gaussian process for machine learning textbook. I, by luck, happened to read that textbook and did some of the problems, so that was easier for me. <laughs> so that was by luck. So, uh, yeah, so in general, you might want to uh, be fairly familiar with whatever field you're applying to and maybe work through some of the standard-ish problems. So th these are the UK. UCL is the most interesting because it's also, uh, it consists, it has the most interesting interview and I think the hardest technical interview by far, which is they put me on the whiteboard and ask me to derive things I know. So let's say you know, let's say evidence lower bound, something very standard machine learning on the Bayesian objective. They ask you, derive it, all right? So you just spend your time deriving it from, from first principles, right? I think this is the hardest by far because there's no way you can prepare for first principle talks because it's basically like, well, uh, do you know this or you don't kind of thing, right? So uh, under the, in those kind of pressures, I think the most important thing is just to keep calm. Okay, you won't necessarily get that kind of interview, but I think it's surprisingly hard to prepare for those interviews. It's surprisingly very stressful in those interviews because you're always thinking, did I did this derivation correctly? Is it wrong? So in those kind of interviews, you want to be always discussing with the prof because that's the point. It's a test, not just your ability to derive things, you know, but also your ability to discuss things with the professor. So yeah, so that was by far the most interesting one. Uh, and, and yeah, so all of these I can't decide UCL. Uh, but this is just it. So this is kind of it for the interview things. You can ask me more about these after the, after the, after the talk because I have a lot of things to say, because I think each of these interviews were different, and they're all quite different from a typical tech interview, so I can talk about them more in depth and like how you can prepare for research interviews in general. Okay? Okay, so we're gonna end off soon. So at the end of the day, don't worry too much. It's very stressful, uh, especially if you're like me who has no backup. Like I came from, a, my main, main degree is math, so I literally have no backups, uh, no SWE backups, so it was very stressful. Uh, so, but those feelings are very normal, and you might want to learn to lean with your friends, and your loved ones, and stuff to talk to profs about your situation because it's really very stressful, especially if you are like me, you know, just only academic, and if you don't make it, well, that's it. So yeah, it's normal <laughs> to be very stressed, and it's it's unfortunately one of the things that I think a lot of people talk about is how stressful it is, how much it occupies your mental space because that mental space could be done doing your FYP better, could be done doing your modules better but it's occupied on caring about the outcome. Yeah, and this is normal, I uh, just wanna say. So like, don't think it's not normal, and yeah, just discuss with people. It's really important, uh, yeah. And lastly, to bring about is that I wanna bring a side note to meta programs. So on top of PhD programs, there might be things called meta programs, which kind of like are on top of a PhD. So these are places you could apply to, and they will kind of send your application to various universities in in like Europe or in Canada, right? And sometimes people who you may not know will come back and email you, hey, there's this open position, you can apply to these things, right? So meta programs exist and they're quite useful because they also allow you to maybe have some fun, like getting accepted in the meta program also allows you to have some money to like visit another lab. Or like for example, Alice, you can actually do academic uh, industry track and that will allow you to do your PhD plus maybe work in DeepMind like 50% of the time. So please apply to meta programs and check them out because not a lot of people know they exist. All right, and I think with that, thanks for listening. Also, if you're interested in AI, join the AI IG Telegram group. And that's it. All right, cool. Thanks. Okay, so we'll proceed to our Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Yeah, it's a very uh, specific, so yeah, just hopefully this is uh, another data point that most people can use to maybe uh, decide if they're going in the industry or academic or how PhD process is like. Yeah, but well, that's interesting. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I might not even have it done. <laughs> I would not have maybe have decided to do theory so early on. Uh, I would recommend people to explore your options earlier on in year one, year two, uh, because locking yourself so early into the whole thing is not a, it's a very stressful process. So uh, explore early on. Uh, don't just decide very quickly that you want to do one thing and then focus your four years on doing one thing. Try to explore first. And then uh, somewhere in year two, you should decide and just focus on this the whole thing for like the next four, three years. Yeah. That's something I'll do differently, to explore earlier in year one more things, and then year two just focus on one thing. Yeah, because locking yourself into one thing and exploring a little bit here and there is 
can be quite stressful because you're, you locked yourself in at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, they lock. They kind of like have a first year where they like married. Yeah. Second year they start dating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the exploration I'm requiring here is more like, uh, you have a f you should choose a topic in mind, but you should broadly read as much as possible and talk to as many professors in this field as possible, because within one subfield, let's say co even computer architecture, or machine learning, or theory of computing, there are many, many, many different things. Read as widely as possible in that field. Like, know and what NLP people are doing, what theory people are doing, what other people are doing, and then quickly decide. Uh, even if you think you read a lot in the beginning, just read even more because it really is very, very broad. And yeah, and the style is all very different. So you want to read, do a little bit of projects in each of these and then decide. Because it's it can be if you decide too early on, it's very tough. Yeah. And also do industry. Don't just choose a few. Explore the industry too. Because I think my problem, like I said, is I lock myself too early on to academic. I think I would, one thing I would definitely do differently is to have more, done more stuff in industry so that I have that option to understand better. And that can also inspire problems to work on in your research. So do that, yeah. Don't just read your field. Like, read machine learning, do a bit of more data science project, do ML ops, try that. It's really important. Because, yeah, you will, you will see a lot of problems that you will not think about in ML ops and later can inspire your research. Yeah, exactly. Don't do that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. In I think that was starting in university year one. Yeah. Then I really think, uh, I think year one, sem one, uh, year one summer was when I decided to focus purely on doing a PhD. Uh, I don't know whether that was a good thing, <laughs> but uh, I decided to focus on that in year one, sem one. Uh, year, sorry, year one summer, year one summer was when I focused on it. Because uh, before that, I was actually thinking about year two, moving to trying out some stuff in industry. I don't know whether, yeah, but I should have done more. Uh, applied work in year one during the semester as well. Don't just leave everything to the summer. Yeah, yeah that's something. Yeah, I really knew I was interested in ML, but year one summer was when I decided I want to do a PhD in ML. And I just focused all my efforts on that. But I think that time I was between industry and, research and, uh, and PhD, I think I didn't explore enough for the industry option to have chosen uh, cho chosen a PhD directly because I think industry has interesting problems like quants and stuff like that. Yeah, so I, I recommend people to have explored a little bit more. Don't just leave, ex leave these explorations during summer. Maybe try different mods in the semester or try your best to squeeze out time to explore these things. Then you can have a better gauge. Yeah, that's something I want to check out. Yeah. And also, don't explore ran two random things. Like, for example, I accidentally explored biology. Don't, don't do that. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> Do uh, explore, but uh, don't just explore completely random things. Uh, that's interesting, but uh, you know, don't don't be related. You know, so don't be too unrelated. Yeah, I I I felt bad. I wasted time exploring too much biology. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like, explore within ML, but don't like explore suddenly something completely random because uh, they may be adjacently related. And they may be helpful, but if you explore something completely random, there's actually a lot of cost in that because you could be spending that time taking a class that's more uh, that maybe does industry ML or something like that, or like more related. And then having, if you explore something too random, it, you may not be able to later on also incorporate that knowledge back. Like, I have not used much biology <laughs> at this point. So, yeah, that's something. Does it make that much of a difference? To, like, uh, if you took 10 classes of ML or bio? I think what would make a difference is maybe doing things like, instead of biology, trying something like, uh, taken like, um, or, uh, computer organization earlier or something like that. Because I think that might have made me shift towards maybe like something like an MLX systems kind of work. And I think yeah, that might be interesting also. Yeah, yeah so that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I did consider applying to EPFL. 
and uh, ETH. I think the reason why I didn't apply them ultimately is because uh, the work I wanted to do there was very theory based and I wanted to do theory plus application, which is why I decided on those schools I have. Because uh, one thing I do believe is that uh, when it comes to, uh, especially if you're doing machine learning and statistics in general, most of the most interesting innovations come from solving a practical problem and developing a theory. So like for example, things like for example, um, least squares was solved because Gauss was working on astronomy. Or Cauchy, right, mathematician, was working on astronomical problems. And then they couldn't solve, then they came up with things like gradient descent and least squares. But they were very interested in application, and then they came up with a theory from there. And I think this trend continues to today. Like with most of the most interesting work in machine learning and uh, ML like today, we see it from people looking at large language models and now thinking, hey, can I form a theory about it? And then from there, we have learned a lot and are now developing newer classes of models from there, right? So that's why I chose a much more applied and uh, theory. So that's why I also didn't apply to uh, EPFL in the end because I felt that like it was pure theory and that wasn't my style because I feel it's just a personal belief from mine. Yeah, that's about it. So, uh, Oh, I decided on UCL in the end. Yeah, so that's also because uh, they have the, like I said, a balance of application and theory. It's a more theory-oriented group than, uh, let's say, a pure robotics lab, but it has a nice balance of the two, and that's what I'm aiming for at the end of the day. <laughs>